Reverend Kennison, or Bill Kennison. You're not a reverend anymore. Welcome, Mr. Bill Kennison. What happened? You just denigrated me. You're not a reverend anymore. Well, I know you don't like to be called reverend, so. No, I don't. I really don't. Anyway, welcome to the Gospel According to Kennison, and I am your illustrious host. I am the man with the beautiful partner and assistant, Sherry. Yes. And she just... I'm waving. <laughs> yeah. I wish they hadn't waved. I'm gonna, one of these you times, I want to be like that uh, bar rescue and hide cameras in here oh, okay. and get you all the time. Good morning, John Lutz. John Lutz, and we are going to pray for Nicole later today, his daughter. Uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, and uh, God's going to take care of her. God's going to take care of her. I sent her a message, and God's going to take care of her. She's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. Good morning, Valerie. Just so. And Valerie, keep those wonders on walks coming. She went. I think you dressed up and went to a Halloween party. Who? Anthony Golden. Good morning. What I did? No, Valerie did. Oh, I thought maybe good I dressed morning, up Mary, as a reverend. Mary Zastro. And good morning to Mary. Tammy and Meyer. Good morning. Who? Tammy Meyer. Tammy Meyer. I know her. Yeah, you I do. know. She she posted some great pictures uh, this weekend of her and Craig and Samantha, and I think that was probably Samantha's uh, boyfriend. Good morning, and, uh, Joe Sumter. Sharon Stone. The Joe. I love the Joe. I talked to him for... I think about an hour this past week. Good man. I love Joe. Good morning, Jerry Nicholson. The whole Nicholson family. And the Nicholson family. That's yes. right. Sharon Stein, good morning. Good morning to Sharon and Stan. And Stan. Good morning, Derek Kustra. Good morning to Derek. Danny James. I think Derek found a whole new well of friends on our program. Because yes. they all seem to... You know, say hello to each other and everything. Yes. Anyway, I think that's great. Keith Pasick. Keith, welcome to Keith. He's been watching us for quite a while. Yeah, Derek Kuster, Danny James, I've already mentioned them. Oh, that right. Danny. Mike Rangel, good morning, Mike. He's Mike watching. Rangel? Yes. Mike Rangel, he isn't going to ask for money, is he? <laughs> he never does. No, oh, he never does. Gosh. One of my... One of my closest and dearest friends, Mike Ringle. Love him. Love him. I just know one thing. I want to keep Mike always on my side. Because if you don't, he can find stuff. You mentioned something, he, really he can, can find it. <laughs> he can. Yes, he can. <laughs> Good morning, Misty Soper. Love Misty. Now, I don't know if she's at work or at home, but we love Misty. Mike Smith is watching. Good hey, morning, Mike. Mike. Good to have Mike. And the names go by so fast if I don't read them, if I don't catch it, if I don't see it. I mean, it goes really fast. So if I don't mention your name, I'm sorry. She has hidden agendas. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mike Smith says, howdy, y'all. <laughs> howdy, y'all. That's right. We're in Texas. I think we talked like that before we ever came to Texas, though. I know you did. You've always talked real Southern from the Oklahoma days. Well, you know, you just alienated every Texas listener and viewer that we have. Oh, well. By saying that. Oh, really? Oh, they don't like Oklahoma. Well, the game well, is pretty Well, you know good what, yesterday. though? I think they don't like California more than they don't like uh, Oklahoma. Well, we did watch the Oklahoma versus Kansas game yesterday. Oh, you sure? You... <laughs> well, you. And might... that's real joy for you to see the but, Oklahoma oh, lose. No, we were watching the Texas game. And, uh, no, I really... We were watching both of them. Yes, we were rooting for Oklahoma. I'm sorry. Jeff Lewis, we were rooting for you. Yeah, we were talking about him, actually. All right, Sherry, I'm putting a stop to this. Okay. We've got lives to change. Go ahead. And, uh, oh, Sherry? Yes. I think I left a little yellow piece of paper on the uh, counter. Yes, you did. I love you folks. That's the reason I do this. Matter of fact, I gave up 
Scarlet's uh, tournament today because we have our program, and uh, that's how much I love you folks, just like family, every one of you. You know, funny thing is, Sherry, when I was in Bible college, uh, they taught us that uh, don't get emotionally involved uh, with your, we actually had a name for it, but I can't call it now, I can't recall it. But uh, it basically was don't get emotionally involved uh, with your audience members. And uh, said it's like a doctor. He just can't. I can't help it. Too late. Yeah, I can't. Sharon, I can't help it. Yeah. We love you. We love you. And uh, if that brings us heartache, then uh, my heartache will ache for you. The first one we want to mention in our prayers this morning is Nicole. That's John Lutz's uh, daughter. Nicole Stonehouse, and uh, uh, she's a sweetie. She is a sweetie, and she got she got a diagnosis this week that uh, she has a bre uh, breast cancer. And I I feel like God just spoke to my heart, almost from the time that John told me, almost from that exact time. God just kind of let me know she's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. We got a lot of people that pray on this program and pray for other people on this program. I want you to put Nicole on your list. And uh, I love her. And that whole that whole family. That whole family. Also, we want to remember Lisa uh, fighting her battle, and, and she's doing well. We were with her and, and her husband and son yesterday. Also want to remember Paulette uh, with her knees and her back, but uh, she's going to be all right. I uh, talked to, I talked to the Joe, actually it wasn't yesterday, it was on Friday. My, my granddaughter had a, a, uh, she was in a play there at her, uh, school and, and Joe sent me a text and then, uh, I called him and we talked, we want to hold Joe up in prayer and every one of you up in prayer. Let me, let me tell you something. This lesson that we teach is for you to take control of your life. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be times you're going to face things you don't want to face. And, uh, but he has given you the strength. Do you know how weak you would be if you had never faced anything? It's, it's the situations that make you strong. And so we want to remember, uh, Joe, also I had a long conversation. I don't have many with, with preachers. It's funny because uh, I don't know if they realize it. We can, we can tell if you're viewing. And uh, the reason I say that is I have so many preachers that would not give me the time of day. I mean, from the time that I managed Sam and it came out, I, man I was managing Sam I had every, almost every single preacher that I know of that blacklisted me. Except there were very, very few. One of them was, was Dr. McKinney, Dr. J, and his beautiful wife and partner, Deborah. And, you know, this is how, this kind of people these are. I, I think they have a, a, a son and a daughter and uh, and, I, and I believe the the son is, is uh, married. I know he's married. And but what I want to tell you is that each one of them have got a master's. They have a doctorate in theology. And if you would like, uh, Doctor J's program actually starts pretty quickly after ours. I want to say one o'clock, but I don't. I mean one o'clock Central Time, but I don't want them to mess it up. But if you if you'd like to give that a listen, I would uh, I'd highly uh, recommend that. Good people. Good people. I go back years, over 30 years with them, and just wonderful people. I want to, uh, I really don't, not convinced on what I'm going to teach you this morning, but we'll cover it all. See, many spiritual teachers have shared with you the secret of deciding who you are. There's a, there's a lot. And being it is the fastest means of affecting and creating your inner self and your outer world. 
That's the quickest way. You want to change things around you? That's the quickest way to do it is to decide who you are. Now, this is not a new teaching. I want to, I want to reinforce that to you. Somebody said, I've never heard anybody else teach this kind of stuff. Well, we may be far and few between, but this is not a new teaching. Yet what may be new is our decision to try it. That's what may be new. I see that uh, many people are scared to death. I see a lot of things, but I, I love the people watch, but I'm looking, I'm watching them. And a lot of people are scared to death to try, I mean, to try to discover who they really are, to claim sovereignty over their lives, to believe that God has given them power, much less that authority. It's just hard for us to accept. The old saying is sometimes we can't see the forest because of the, the trees. I also see that many people are afraid to believe that the wisdom of God lies within them. Joe, Misty, the Nicholsons, I can go, I go on, Derek, Mike, Maui, I can I can go on and on and talk specifically to you that God has not just given you power. He has given you authority. I see that many people that actually feel guilty about creating a new spirituality based on having honest conversations with God and forging a genuine friendship with God. We live in... Tough times. I don't, I don't even know any other way to put it. Difficult times. And I see that people are, they have fear and guilt and that that is their biggest enemies. That's their biggest enemies is fear and guilt. It's not somebody else. It's not another country. It's not a, another terrorist group. Whatever, even though we got a president uh, uh, that won't even call the Hamas terrorists. But uh, I'm not going to get on that so much this morning. You see, I, that's the biggest enemies of people. What are they afraid of? They're afraid of God. Isn't that something? They're afraid of death. That's clear, but the reason they're afraid of, of death is because of what they have been told about life and God. No wonder they're afraid. Most people are so afraid of dying, they have become too fearful to live. And so they surrender their living. Now listen. They surrender their living to those who are not afraid of dying. Good example is suicide bombers and the nations with the biggest armies, armies and, the, and the most bombs. We cannot go on like this. Our world cannot sustain itself with fear as its guiding principle. We just can't do that. How can we believe in love and not be afraid of dying? We have been taught to believe in a God who loves us in very unloving ways. This is what we've been taught. Who then let us die and who punishes us with death. That is why if you wish to live in peace and harmony, you must change your world at the level of belief. I'm going to bring this down to, to, every, to us every day. One person at a time. That's all we need to change. One person at a time. And we are starting with you. This is a new revelation. You cannot die. And you will never be condemned to eternal damnation. Mark those checklists off. You cannot die. Somebody said everybody dies. 
You cannot die. I want to explain it to you. And you will never be condemned to eternal damnation. When you decide to live, live it as your truth, it will change everything. Your everything, your finances, your success. Some of you, some of you feel like this morning, you're at the end of the road. You don't know what to do. You don't know which way to turn. I've been there many times. And after I got through it, I'd always turn around and go, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for allowing me to know who I am and for me to overcome those obstacles. Most of your world's religions have taught these first three words of this truth. You cannot die. Yet, they have said to you after those three words have turned this truth into a nightmare. They have told you your soul never dies. That's what they tell you. But they have also told you that your soul could spend eternity in hell. And their description of what could cause you to spend eternity in hell as well as what could cause you to spend it in heaven has created a hell on earth, not only for you, but for everyone else. Boy, and their description, their description of what could cause you to spend eternity in hell, as well as what could cause you to spend it in heaven, their description is that some religions have taught that killing others for the right reasons will send you straight to heaven. That's why you got these maniacs in the Middle East. While others have instructed that believing in God, but doing it in the wrong way, will send you to hell. Now, if that doesn't twist your head around, nothing will. I declare to you now, these teachings are wholly and completely inaccurate. They are wrong. They are just wrong. They were brought to you, they were brought to your world not by God, but by human beings. Humans assume that God must be angry, vindictive, revengeful, and retributive because humans are angry, vengeful, revengeful, and retributive. Human beings thought that God designed eternal life based on a system of reward and punishment. If you do good, remember the, it's actually like a fairy tale to me, but God is going to sit on his throne. That's what we've been told. He's going to open up a book. He's going to find your name. That's going to be one big book. He's going to find your name, and then he's going to see all the good things you did. I, I thought we were saved by grace through faith. I, I, I didn't know it. We were taught by our, our, that our eternity was decided by the things that we did right or wrong. But that's what we've been taught. That he's going to open up his book. I'm going to look at your good and look at your bad. And when he gets all through, he's going to make the decision that either you're going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. You see, that is a system of reward and punishment. Reward and punishment, as I have pointed out, uh, a human social convention has nothing to do with divinity. It is not a divine notion for a, a human contrivance replacing the religion idea of unconditional love. But I want to tell you something. With everything that's going on, I have great news for you. There is hope. I told you that last week. There is hope. There is an extraordinary opportunity. In the parable of Jesus about the prodigal son, joy is the wayward son coming to himself. That was his joy. That's when he found joy is when he came to himself. He comes to the realization that he's out in the far country. 
He's cut off from all that is real. That's not real. His real, his reality was back home with his dad and, and his family. He's been seeking the things he thinks will make his life meaningful. Doesn't that sound like some of us? Suddenly, he knows that the meaning is not found in the world of or in things only in himself. He found out he took his inheritance. He took his, what the law, what he felt belonged to him. He never found joy. He never found happiness. He never found that meaningfulness that we have in our life of being here. Suddenly, he knows that meaning is not found in the world. It's only in himself. Coming to himself is coming to the realization of his oneness with God and with all life. We need to come to ourself, our true self. We need to come to that. If we will, we'll find joy. Joy is knowing that at the heart and root of all of us, regardless of our outer circumstances, don't get caught up with that. Somebody said, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, there's always enough love to go around. Don't get caught up in outer circumstances. Joy is knowing that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Greater. That's you. That's you. It's greater. You see, joy means love. Not as an emotion or sentiment. Not as something that happens between people. You know, they say that pretty... Pretty lightly, they go out with you on a date and kiss you, and all of a sudden, they're in love. I don't want to be mean, but that's that's not love. It is something that is forever happening between man and his love center. And we know that that's God within us. Romans 6 and 23 says this, the free, F-R-E-E, -E, free, the free gift of God is eternal life. That's the free gift of God. Eternal life is not a right to be earned. You can't earn eternal life. But it is a reality to be accepted and lived. You may not even realize that your eternal life has already begun. Your eternal life began before you were born, and it just came with you into this, this paradigm. It is in the living of eternal life that we know freedom. Freedom. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, I think I've told you this before, said, Man is born free, and I love this so much. Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. Yet he was born free. Hmm. His chains, chains are caused by the frustration of his own potentiality. You know, I guess when you get older, they say when you get old, you live in your dreams. You live in your memories. And... When I look back, and I think of myself as a child, I, I did not picture, I did not picture what life and God had waiting for me. I wanted to be everything as I was growing up. I wanted to be a baseball player. I wanted to do this. I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to do that. I, I wanted to keep doing these, these things because I thought that's what I really wanted until... One day, I woke up with a hangover, one of the worst hangovers I've ever had on a New Year's morning on my birthday. I woke up and I, man, I couldn't even hardly move without having problems. 
God spoke to me. And what he told me was, you are my son. Now, I've heard that preached by my dad and by other preachers most of, you know, up to that short time in my life. I think at that time I was 18. You are my son. Probably the first time I actually could say I heard God speak inside of me. Then he went further and said, you're not only my son, you'll change and everything around you will change as you realize my love. Why would that be? That was because his love convinces us of who we are. What he was really telling me is, you are my son. Doesn't make any difference what you do from this point. You're going to know you're my son and you will change as you realize this truth. Folks, get back to who you really are. Some of you may be running around talking about how you think you're a loser. No, no, who are you really? You're a child of the God that made this world. Carry yourself that way. I'll never forget I was in Atlanta and uh, was holding a big meeting, and they had a big boxing tournament. We, uh, I was staying at this uh, Marriott downtown, beautiful uh, hotel. And the preacher and I, Michael Spires, we were sitting there. We were almost the only ones in the coffee shop before I went upstairs and went to bed, except there was a table with uh, Muhammad Ali and a little bit of his entourage, his uh, security, and, and there was a couple other people. I just want to show you something how that this works. If you carry yourself as the king and you carry yourself as the son of God, he got up as he was leaving. He got up and came over to the table. And he stopped right there in front of me. Big man. Had the biggest hands I've ever seen. Anyway, he stopped. And he said, what is it about you, man? I said, I don't know. No, there's something about you. So what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a preacher. And he goes, uh, do you pray for people? I said, yes, I pray for people. He said, would you pray for me? This is Muhammad Ali. Would you pray for me? And I said, yes, I will. He said, will you pray for me right now? And he stuck out that big hand. And I said, yes, I will. And I prayed for him. And then we just spent another probably 30 minutes of, of just talking to each other. What I'm trying to show you is, though, I try to carry myself as a son of God, as a son of the creator of this universe. I am his son. Months later, and I don't know how, I don't, I don't even know if, if I even told Muhammad Ali my name, but I was, Sam was doing a show in New York, and, and a guy came in named Don King. And I was back in, the, back in the office, and Sam was up on stage, and he came back and he said, are you uh, Sam's manager? And I said, yep. Yeah. What can I do for you? And he started telling me, you know, I, I want to, I want to uh, sponsor one of your tours. And then he stopped and he looked at me. He said, did you pray for Muhammad Ali a few months ago? And I said, yes, I did. How do you know? And he said, he told me, when you see him, you'll know him. That was all. So he didn't give you my name? He said, no. He just said, when you see him, you'll know him. Now I've seen you, and I know what he's talking about. You know what they were talking about? They were talking about a child of the living God. Not out there 
doing all kinds of signs and wonders in them. No, there was something about me that they needed that, that knowledge. You see, there is no greater bondage than the restriction of love. And no greater freedom than the full experience of inner love. The American Declaration of Independence, prized document that it is, has one serious flaw. Somebody said, man, you really coughed in of yourself. Yeah, yeah, I'm a child of God. And it talks of the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The greatest flaw in this great document is the idea of the pursuit of happiness. It is presented to go out into the far country, like the prodigal son, in search of the things that will bring happiness and, and meaning to his life. Well, this is that great delusion that controls the lives of most people. It may be the very cause of overemphasis on materialism. Sherry's all into it. In our American way of life, we usually will say when this or that happens, I'll be happy. When I get that raise in salary, or I get that beautiful home, or when the kids are through college, or when the bills are paid, then I'll be happy. Joy never comes through self-indulgence. Only through self-realization. Comedian Sam Kennison, my illustrious brother, once told me, and believe me, he knew what it was to be without. And he once told me, and I think he, Sherry was there, and he said, I was happier when I had nothing. When I was preaching the gospel and sometimes didn't have money to get out of town, I was happier. There's nothing wrong with things, folks. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with things. It's a matter of priorities. If we set our goal at having things, we'll have it at the expense of our being, and we will come to know a deeper inner want that no outer thing can satisfy. But if we seek to be, then out of the fullness of being will come an increase of creativity. I want to tell you all something. We've been getting you know, fairly deep here in the last few weeks. And I haven't lost my drive to have, for you to have a better life, but I'm telling you how to do it. You have to believe who you are. No one, no one can take that away from you. You are a child of the living king. I don't care what vessels God used to get you into this world. I don't care if you were planned or you weren't planned. He was a surprise or they planned on it. I don't, I, I don't care. God is the one that brought you into this world. You're here at the time. He wanted you here. He put you in that family for you to be able to overcome everything in your life and be a child of the living king. That's who you are. That's who you are. Life is not just an experience involving people and jobs and houses and money. Matter of fact, the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And I'm gonna I'm gonna quit after just this little thing, but I've got so much more I want to give you. Luke 17 32, it says, It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In trying to define this kingdom, Jesus said it was like a seed that was planted in the ground and it grew and brought forth plenty. You see, the word heaven, and this is what I really want to get to, comes from the Greek word, root word of Oranus, which means expanding. So, let me read this correctly. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of expansion. Expand your beliefs. Expand your knowledge. Expand your, 
your identity as a child of God. And you'll have more than you can ask or think. Somebody goes, but you don't understand. I haven't got any way to get it. It doesn't have to. God will supply. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time we've had this morning. And I ask you to touch every single person. Let, let that door of knowledge open up in them. Let them forget about what they considered failures in their life and what they considered bad things. And let them recognize they're still your children. They're still your child. I ask that you bring them happiness and joy and peace and money and success and health and above all things, the kingdom of expansion. Now I'll give you all the praise. Amen. Well, Sherry, mm -hmm. I still got about an hour, hour and a half here, but you know, you need to realize who you are. Step always <laughs> controlling me. Love you too, Scott Ross. Is Scott on there, man? You should have told me. I would have changed this whole message. Yes. You all have a good week. Thank you, Derek Kustra, Sharon Stein, the God in us. Yes. Misty Soper said, more please. <laughs> I wish I could. I really do. I wish I could. But the truth of the matter is, folks, if I, if I went another 15 minutes, then we'd have someone there going, tell him it's time to quit. I remember my grandfather. Sherry, you'll remember this. We was in Peoria, and we had just a bad weather, and we had a, a few people show up, I think, for a midweek teaching uh service or whatever you want to call it. My grandfather was there and I was getting ready to just tell the folks go on home and, and Sunday we'll have, you know, several hundred people here and we'll, we'll just pick it up there. Just get ready. And so my grandfather came down and, and Sherry always said I'd end up looking like him. And if you want to know what he looked like, only you have a flat top instead of a bald head. Uh, but I remember he came down and goes, you know, Bill, I'm a, you know, I'm a farmer. And I said, yeah, I know, I know, Grandpa. And he said, well, you know what I learned? I learned when it's time to feed, I don't wait to see how many cows are cut them and eat. I just put it out there and I feed them. And if that's two or three or if that's 30, they eat. So I think you need to, you need to feed us since we all came here tonight. So I'm all inspired. I got up, man. I, I laid a message on him for an hour and a half. And after it was all through, I remember I, my grandfather came up and gave me a hug. And he said, well, now, I should have told you something else. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, I don't give the cows that show up all the feed. That went down. You remember that? <laughs> so that's the reason that, that we cut it a little short. I love you. Sherry loves you. God loves you. God bless America and God bless Israel and I stand with Israel all the way to victory. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Amen.